This is Duke University. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Laura Lieber. I'm the co-director of the Duke Center for Jewish Studies, and I would like to welcome you to this event. I would like to begin by expressing my tremendous gratitude to a number of parties without whom this event, eagerly anticipated for months, um, could not have come to pass. With no further ado on my, on my part, on behalf of the Duke Center for Jewish Studies, I welcome to the podium Professor Eric Myers, co-director of the Center for Jewish Studies, to introduce Ambassador Pickering. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your kind remarks. But the real reason for us today to be here is to hear Ambassador Pickering, whom I've known for decades and who has a very, very exciting career in the diplomatic service. And I will just give you a few highlights of it. He's from Rutherford, New Jersey, and went on from there to Bowdoin College, where I almost went to college, chose Dartmouth over Bowdoin, actually, and was a very challenging decision, but um, my uncle, who was a Dartmouth graduate, allowed me to make that decision easy. And before joining the State Department, Ambassador Pickering went on to, re to the Fletcher School at Tufts University for a degree there, and a Fulbright scholarship, and another MA in International Relations from the University of Melbourne in Australia. He served before joining the State Department in the U.S. Navy from 1956 to 59, and later served in the Naval Reserve where he reached the rank of Lieutenant Commander. His four decade long career in foreign service included ambassadorships in the following, Russia, India, the United Nations, Israel, El Salvador, Nigeria, and Jordan. And additionally, he served as Under Secretary for Political Affairs from 1997 to 2000. And he holds the rank of career ambassador, the highest in the US foreign service, a great honor for him to hold well-deserved. And most recently, he was chosen to author and chair the investigation of the Benghazi incident, um, which I'm sure you've all heard about and know very well. He has a North Carolina connection. He has a place in Ocracoke. And he had a little run-in um, with Jesse Helms some years ago as he was about to become, after he became ambassador to El Salvador uh, and uh, was defended by Ronald Reagan who had selected him to be ambassador, but um, some of you might have heard his response to that affair on the radio NPR today. Tom Pickering is a rare ambassador because he shares a love of history and archaeology, that is something very special to him, something very special to me. When he takes a trip in the Middle East, he likes to visit sites. He likes, even when he was ambassador, liked to get in his Jeep and go out unaccompanied, except for his beloved wife, Alice, and come look at sites. And, and he could always be uh, found uh, picking up sherds and um, even prehistoric artifacts. He's also been a huge booster of our American Schools of Oriental Research and our centers in Amman, uh, Jerusalem, and Nicosia, Cyprus. And I served as, had the privilege of serving as president when we celebrated our 100th anniversary in the State Department in the year 2000, when he was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. So with a robust Blue Devil welcome, and with enormous appreciation for your distinguished service to our country, may I present to you all the Honorable Ambassador Thomas Reeve Pickering. Thank you, Eric, very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for your warm and welcoming applause. And uh, let me just say, Barachim Habayim, to all of you, 
Uh, it's a pleasure to see you here this afternoon, and I'm deeply honored by being asked to deliver this distinguished uh, lectureship. Um, I want to talk about the Middle East in perhaps different ways. Uh, like a lot of people who know and understand the Middle East, we all come to appreciate how little we know, how in some ways we are on a constant learning curve. And we're there today, and I feel very much there today, even though Eric had the temerity to call me a, a, an historical artifact. The Middle East, across the spectrum from the Pillars of Hercules at Gibraltar all the way to the Hindu Kush, uh, to the mountains at the end of Pakistan, uh, has been in turmoil, uh, going through rapid change, and seemingly moving away from some of the stability we have come to expect uh, to a large degree of instability. Uh, it is an area that has been enormously important for the United States, not only because the source of a tremendous amount of energy for us and the rest of the world, uh, but also uh, for its many other exports to us. Uh, cotton, certainly, agricultural commodities, hard minerals, um, and intellectual attainment. Uh, we have the enormous pleasure of welcoming here students from all across the Middle East. Uh, our ties with the Middle East are especially strong with Israel and have been, and they're now under some little bit of stress, as you have heard. And it is my good fortune to speak to you between uh, BB1 and BB2. He spoke this morning um, at APAC, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to catch his speech. I've only heard little bits and pieces. Uh, and he will speak tomorrow in the Congress uh, before a joint session of the House and Senate. Um, and he will, in that particular sense, have come to the United States in the midst of his own election campaign under a set of circumstances where, for a number of reasons, uh, President Obama felt even more estranged from Prime Minister Netanyahu and even more concerned, in fact, that the uh, particular speech was arranged uh, by one party and by not members of the executive branch or indeed of the other party in a serious way. Uh, this is leading to a situation where the bipartisanship of American affinity and support for Israel is under a bit more stress than it should be. I'll talk a little more about that uh, in a few minutes in various ways. Um, as I define the Middle East for you, it's perhaps useful for me to start in the east and, like the sun, work my way west. Uh, in that regard, Afghanistan and Pakistan have been very much on our minds. And over the years, we've had a number of distinguished American diplomats leading the effort to try to deal uh, with the problem of those two states in South Asia. Uh, we have not been successful, uh, but we're continuing at it. Uh, and there are a number of things that I think we should keep in mind. Uh, the first is that from the point of view of American interests, it really ought to be called Pakistan-Afghanistan. Uh, our interests there are much uh, more important and enduring in longer term. And this is in no way uh, to offend any Afghans who might be present here in the audience or who might catch my words at some point, uh, but to try to talk about a stark truth. It is also very significant that they are each in one way or another tied up uh, with the success of the governments that are now in place and future governments. Uh, it is also significant that as we look at Afghanistan, uh, where we are continuing to move out, uh, but where in effect uh, Pakistan plays a huge role in continuing to maintain stability. Uh, my own sense is that in Afghanistan, there are two important questions uh, that we cannot now answer, but nevertheless will help to determine the outcome. Uh, one of those is a regional question. Uh, can Afghanistan, with its own military forces, perhaps aided with supply from outside, uh, continue to defend a large share of the country? And the answer to that is not in. Uh, so far, it looks tenuous. 
uh, not certain in either directions, but very significant. And secondly, can Pakistan and Afghanistan reach some kind of meeting of their minds? In large measure because Pakistan's continued support uh, for the Taliban and others insurgents, if I can put it that way, inside Afghanistan uh, from their own safe position uh, on the southern border. Of course, for Afghans, there is no southern border because the British put the line in and they never recognized it. Um, but can, can Pakistan uh, find a way forward? Uh, the third question, or the, perhaps the second major question is, as we draw down uh, on our troop commitment, and it has now been very heavily drawn down, uh, can we continue to convince the American Congress uh, that it is important for us uh, to support and extend our support uh, both to Pakistan and Afghanistan? Uh, Pakistan is even more difficult. Uh, I won't go into this in large detail, uh, but in the future of Pakistan, uh, two sets of forces uh, play the most important role. Uh, one is the military, and, and the military deals uh, almost exclusively in Pakistan with the fundamental policy decisions made uh, on such subjects as dealing with India, uh, the future of the Pakistani nuclear weapons program, and how to deal with Afghanistan. Uh, these are all top drawer, uh, amazingly important issues. Uh, I think the second uh, point to make about Pakistan is uh, that it has had a, a number of elected governments, but only one, the previous government, went out of office peacefully. Uh, and that's significant. Thirdly, uh, it is clear that Pakistan's political parties uh, represent nothing but clan and tribal machines to keep themselves in office. And as a result, there's a very weak affinity in Pakistan uh, to democracy. Um, and a deep degree, uh, because of the major differences, uh, of splits in, Afghan in Pakistan about its own future. Uh, there is a lot that can be done, uh, including its economy and its finances, uh, dealing fundamentally with education and educational change uh, and creating uh, an energy base for it to continue to operate on. Uh, these are all important and they're complementary uh, to what has to happen in Pakistan uh, with respect to Afghanistan. Uh, the answers for Pakistan are really quite deep fundamental changes. Uh, and I say that against the backdrop of knowing, as we all know intrinsically, that countries don't change course very easily and taking courses which involve them in painful weather and high seas is not something they like to do. Uh, and so Pakistan continues in many ways to totter on a brink or two, to totter on a brink potentially of nuclear war with India, to totter on the brink of having uh, the Taliban organization in Afghanistan, which is now also uh, become very strong in that, inside Pakistan, uh, become the major public enemy and indeed a major threat uh, to the lives, welfare, and progress among Pakistan's citizens. And so all of those issues have to be treated well, uh, and we need to do everything we can uh, to be supportive of these two countries as they go ahead, despite our dwindling national interest in them in terms of uh, the vital potential that they may have uh, to cause us existential problems. Um, if you think that that's all very easy, uh, let me now jump a little bit uh, to the West. One of the first of the three I-word countries uh, about which we used to think, think they were the sum total of what uh, serious problems might arise in the Middle East uh, that we would have to play a role in helping to solve. <clears throat> now with the so-called Arab Spring, uh, I like to call it transformation, uh, we see an entirely different construct uh, of the region. Uh, but Iran is itself very, very important. Uh, we could spend the whole lecture on Iran, but let me just sketch out a few high points and then some of the things that uh, we need to think about doing that we aren't yet doing. 
uh, and that will come uh, if, in fact, we are successful uh, with European uh, partners, Russia and China, in effecting a negotiated solution to Pakistan's nuclear weapons potential. Um, it's significant that Iran itself, uh, for many countries, remains a large source of petroleum uh, and owns and has not yet exploited uh, very significant gas resources at the bottom of the Persian Gulf. Uh, it is also important to recognize that behind the negotiations and the current set of preoccupations, there are two fundamental issues. Uh, one fundamental issue is Pakistan, based on its interpretation of our actions uh, over the 30-some years since the revolution in 1978, and believes that the primary objective of the United States with respect to Iran is regime change. Uh, I would not myself uh, believe that it is, uh, and I believe it's possible to make that conclusion on a worst-case analysis of a number of developments between Pakistan and the United States that have occurred. Uh, we have our own counterpart, if I could call it that way, of that overarching strategic factor in dealing with Pakistan. And that's our deep concern with its nuclear program, uh, the concern that we all have uh, that it might be moving toward uh, creating a nuclear weapon, um, and against the backdrop of an official finding by the United States intelligence community, uh, repeated annually by its director so far, uh, that he has very high confidence that Iran has made no decision to make a nuclear weapon. What we all see in Iran, however, is an ongoing program uh, which has many aspects of it uh, clearly civilian in nature and some dual use. Uh, which will give Pakistan, if it doesn't have it already, the capacity to make such a weapon uh, were it decided to do so. And that's what the negotiations have been about. I won't go into the long history of the Iranian nuclear program, only to say uh, that over a period of time, uh, beginning about 2003, negotiations have been attempted to see whether there is a way to create what I would call a strong firewall uh, against Pakistan misusing uh, its civil nuclear program uh, to create nuclear weapons. And that's what the present set of negotiations is about. Um, and I'll discuss a little bit about where it's come and maybe some of the things that may result uh, from a success in that negotiation. Uh, one primary argument is uh, that it's incumbent upon any state leading in the world uh, where there is the possibility of an international conflict uh, to do all that it can to stop that particular effort forward that it objects to, uh, but also to do so first in the diplomatic sphere uh, before resorting to armaments and their use as a last resort. Uh, it is uh, significant that um, the first agreement made with Pakistan, uh, signed on the 24th of November 2013, uh, bought us uh, a lot of change in, Pakistan, uh, in, in, in Iran's nuclear policy. I'm sorry if I said Pakistan. Uh, this is a section about Iran. Uh, it, and it made for uh, much change. Uh, it did away with all of the material uh, that Pakistan had enriched to 20%. Uh, and moving up the scale of enrichment uh, toward 90%, uh, which is bomb quality fissile material, uh, there is, it becomes easier to increase the percentage numbers in the use of the centrifuge programs. Uh, and that's a physical fact of, of, of life. Um, it is finally true that uh, in the November 24th agreement 2013, uh, access to Iranian's nuclear program uh, by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's nuclear watchdog agency, has increased remarkably. Iran accepted in that agreement uh, a series of access ideas that have never been accepted or imposed on another country, including daily access to key nuclear facilities inside Iran, which the IAEA is using. Um, 
just another word uh, about the 2013 agreement. 2013 agreement uh, provided for follow-on negotiations, uh, hopefully to have been able to take place successfully in six months. And we're now uh, near the end of the third six months postponement of that particular effort. Iran also agreed uh, that its program uh, had to stay civil and that its needs for uh, such sensitive uh, services as enrichment had to be based on the need for the output, uh, low enriched uranium in the civil program. Uh, and that was a benchmark. And so future negotiations are to be based on that particular uh, statement uh, or benchmark, as I just explained it. Um, and that's very important. It is also true that uh, every month that has gone by since November 2013, the United Nations Watchdog Agency has reported full Iranian compliance with that agreement, which has been very interesting because there have been many doubters. There were many doubters as well that because that agreement provided a small amount of sanctions relief uh, by releasing Iran's own money to itself, uh, that uh, people would come to Iran uh, and believe that a new opening was on the threshold and seek right away uh, to ignore or disobey the international sanctions regime in place. And I'm happy to say that hasn't happened. The present negotiations, according to the reports that we all see, have resolved a number of problems um, and left the door open to three major questions that are still outstanding. Now, one of those is how much enrichment should Iran be permitted? Uh, the second is how fast will the U.S. and others remove sanctions from Iran in the context of the implementation of this particular program that's under negotiation uh, for curtailing and curbing Iran's effort to make nuclear weapons. Um, and, and that's a, a particularly important point. Um, it is also, I think, very important to understand um, that having come close in this particular area, uh, the third question that will have to be resolved is how long does the agreement stay in force um, and certainly what might happen after the agreement uh, is uh, terminated uh, by having run its course. Um, and there the differences have been between three years on the U.S. side, I'm sorry, three years on the Iranian side and 20 years on the U.S. side. Um, and it looks interestingly now uh, that that problem is moving toward resolution uh, by the application of different time periods to different parts of the program. Um, and I think that's a novel and useful way to proceed. Um, it is also, I think, clear with respect to enrichment uh, that the differences between the parties, if I can give you the numbers, uh, were something like Iran's interest, high interest, in keeping 9,620 centrifuges going which was the full number of centrifuges they had operating in 2013, uh, November 24th. Um, and they would also like uh, to do as much as they could uh, to continue to keep those numbers. This represents 9,000 out of 19,000 centrifuges they built. Um, the U.S. has come into the negotiations with a number like 1,500 centrifuges. Um, the negotiations, I think, now have the Iranians down, uh, somewhere between four and 6,000. Um, and we understand, uh, but without any direct confirmation, uh, that the U.S. would be prepared to live with 4,500 or something in that ballpark. Um, the important question to remember here is it is not the number of centrifuges which is important. It's the degree to which they can produce a certain output that's very significant. Uh, we measure centrifuge output uh, with something called a separative work unit. And it defines the result uh, of a particular centrifuge's uh, capacity in, while it's spinning uh, in a single year period. Um, so uh, for 
the present Iranian centrifuges, uh, which produce a little less than one separate work unit per, per atom, uh, it can be translated in terms of enrichment uh, to something like 4,500 separative work units. Um, and it's important to do this because the Iranian centrifuges are very weak. They produce between 0.7 uh, and one centrifuge annually. And the benchmarks for the best centrifuges are 100 times better than the current Iranian centrifuge. It's very old technology acquired from Pakistan clandestinely uh, by having bought it from the father of the Pakistan nuclear weapon, uh, a doctor by the name of A.Q. Khan. Um, the third issue is taking off sanctions. And there is a very serious difficulty there. Uh, the dominant party in the Congress uh, doesn't want to do this. Um, and it wants to impose more sanctions, many of the people involved, in the hope that if some sanctions got you somewhere, larger amounts of sanctions would get you even further down the road. The really interesting problem is that it has forgotten uh, that in addition to sanctions, uh, the Iranians have in their, uh, on their own um, not been particularly effective at running their economy. Uh, President Ahmadinejad, who left office two years ago, in fact, did a great deal to ruin it. Uh, and so the sanctions put more spin, if I can put it this way, on the economic downturn uh, ball, rather than necessarily, in my view, are the determining character. And there is a great danger with more sanctions, not sanctions relief, uh, that Iran will do a couple of things. Uh, that it will decide to make a nuclear weapon because it sees no way out. Uh, it is highly attached to its own technology which it claims to have developed itself, and so it's become an important domestic policy issue in gen in, in inside uh, Iran to defend a number of centrifuges. Um, where can it go? Well, I can see bridge building uh, between 4,000 and 6,000, and some of that has been taking place, I believe. It is also important to know uh, that it is the amount of enriched material uh, you start with, principally, uh, the degree of enrichment. And Iran has been making for civil purposes enriched material at the level of 3.5%. If they have that material in stockpile and have even a similar or smaller amounts of more highly enriched material, it doesn't take them as long to get to 80 or 90% um, as it would if they went to zero. And so there's been an effort also uh, to complement uh, the effort to reduce the number of centrifuges uh, by keeping in place um, the uh, present uh, centrifuges of Iran and their low capacity uh, to produce additional material rapidly. Um, one of the judgments that will be made about the agreement is whether at these levels of enrichment and with no stockpile, because another effort has been uh, to either uh, reduce the stockpile uh, by, uh, in effect, uh, turning it back in uh, to uh, pre-enriched uh, uh, Iranian material, um, and also uh, to transfer out of Iran some of that material uh, to be fabricated uh, into fuel elements which are necessary uh, to run reactors. Iran has several reactors, one from us, that produce medical isotopes for cancer treatment. Um, and it is, uh, has a large Russian-built reactor on the coast for electrical power. Uh, happily, the Russian policy on nonproliferation, which they've been staunch about, is if they build you a reactor, you have to take their fuel. But even more important, you have to send the used fuel back, because one of the uh, outputs of a reactor, even if it makes uh, even if it makes electrical power with low enriched uh, uranium, um, it is uh, the fact uh, that um, taking back the spent fuel takes away another byproduct of the fission reaction, uh, which is plutonium, 
which when chemically separated uh, can itself be a source material for a nuclear weapon. And so it's important that that, that continue. Uh, the Iranians would like to have the Russians at the end of their first contracted 10-year period to provide fuel in 2021, uh, provide that fuel for themselves. Uh, that raises enormously difficult problems. Um, these reactors, I'm sorry, uh, yes, these reactors, the current Russian reactor requires 22 tons of fuel, uh, which is something on the order of 200,000 separative work units to achieve. Um, and that puts Iran in a position, obviously, uh, to further enrich quite rapidly, if it wished to do so, with some technical changes. And, and that's why it's very important that there is now intense ongoing inspection, uh, because any effort uh, by Iran to change its enrichment processes to go to higher levels uh, would be discovered by the annual visits, uh, the photography that is taken, uh, the access they have uh, the UN people have to Iranian uh, enrichment uh, cascades uh, uh, of centrifuges. Um, so my hope is that there will be an agreement. Uh, the agreement on March, at the end of March this month, uh, is conceived of as an agreement that settles the major outstanding issues, including the three that I talked to you about in detail. Um, and then there will be another period till end of July, when all of the nitty gritty details uh, have to be put down by the lawyers and the experts to carry out uh, the uh, previous agreement uh, on solving the major issues. Um, I think there is a possibility, a serious one, of getting an agreement, but nobody has said it's a, a slam dunk 100%. Uh, it is still an area of continuing doubt and difficulty. Uh, I believe you will be seeing Secretary Kerry uh, playing an increasingly intensive personal role in negotiations as we get to the end of March. And I think you will see the Iranian foreign minister playing exactly the same role. Uh, and that's an important part of the process of going ahead. Uh, I would not change now uh, the negotiating approach that's now in place. Uh, it will produce, if we're right in where we believe it should go, uh, a, at least a one-year time for Iran to acquire a sufficient amount of highly enriched uranium to make a nuclear weapon, and it would have to throw away or get rid of the nuclear inspectors that are there to be able to do that in that period of time. Anything else would take longer. That breakout time idea as a constraint or the measure of a constraint on Iran's program is designed to produce uh, a situation in which there is plenty of time to react to a decision to make a nuclear weapon uh, without necessarily starting with the use of force. But President Obama has kept the use of force on the table uh, because he says uh, he's determined to prohibit Iran from getting a nuclear weapon and prepared to use whatever is on the table and necessary to do that, uh, even though the consequences there uh, would be importantly large for us. Um, I think that uh, at this stage, one or two remarks uh, could be made about after a nuclear agreement if we get one. Uh, one of the things the nuclear agreement will do is it will open up the possibilities for both sides to talk to each other uh, about areas of common interest in the region, uh, including Afghanistan, uh, where we in Iran both dislike the idea of the Taliban making up a government of Iran. Uh, and in Iraq, where we're both opposed uh, to ISIS or Daesh, as it's spoken in, in Arabic. Um, and those are important possibilities. Beyond that, uh, there are other things that we could do with Iran uh, to help to stabilize uh, the uncertainty uh, and the challenges uh, across the Persian Gulf. Uh, and that's significant. Uh, the Arab states have their reservations about whether what we are doing is correct and in their interest. Although each of them had the reservations about the first agreement of November, 20, November 24, 2013. <clears throat> uh, let me now turn further east to Iraq and to Syria. Uh, because of the presence of ISIS or ISIL, uh, we now can look at these as a joint problem 
even though we have had a strong tendency to see them as separate uh, and to be resolvable on separate terms. Uh, ISIS came, uh, was developed in northern Syria and still controls pieces of northeast Syria. Um, it controls now less land than it had uh, at its furthest extension. And this morning, the Iraqi military uh, launched an effort to take over uh, the town of Tikrit, north of Baghdad, uh, which was in the hands uh, of ISIS. Uh, it's a Sunni town. Indeed, it was uh, Saddam Hussein's own hometown. Um, and while we have no real reports yet uh, on the effort, there is some optimism about these retrained Iraqi troops uh, together with their militia allies, including even some Sunnis, uh, can move ahead. The fundamental problems uh, in Iraq uh, come from the strength of the insurgency that still exists, as well as a lot of political issues. The most important one of which is that while it is a Shia, Arab, Muslim country, uh, there are very large numbers of Sunnis. Um, in addition, there is a third factor, the presence of Kurds in, in northeast uh, Iraq uh, on a border which is, uh, touches a Kurdish population in Iran and a very large Kurdish population in Turkey. Um, one of the reasons why I believe ISIS was so successful uh, was that former Prime Minister Maliki uh, disliked intensely the Sunnis, uh, treated them badly in a number of cases, and created a situation uh, where small radical groups that were started in Syria uh, could begin to recruit larger numbers of people. And that's essentially what, what they have done. Uh, the US idea uh, is to train and equip Iraqi forces, Sunni, Shia, and Kurds, uh, to push ISIS out, uh, presumably back to eastern Syria, uh, presumably off the map, if they can do that. Uh, that's been estimated by senior American military leaders to take roughly two and a half years if they're successful. Uh, that's extremely difficult. Uh, I think there has to be a complementary program uh, by the new Iraqi prime minister uh, to create a really important set of relationships with the Sunni minority. Uh, the Kurds will be able to take care of themselves with a little bit of outside help, but they cannot free up all of northern Iraq. Uh, the Kurds have land claims in northern Iraq, and so their interest is obviously in moving outward uh, to some of their historic highs with respect to, uh, with respect to land in Iraq. Uh, Mosul is still in the hands of ISIS. It's the second largest city in Iraq in population. Uh, and as you know, ISIS continues to carry out its depredations. A combination, in my view, of military, uh, political, and economic assistance is required uh, to begin to turn the tables uh, in Iraq. Um, and I see that coming, but very reluctantly and very troubling uh, in the way in which it is not flowing uh, as rapidly as it might be. Um, inside Syria, uh, the problem is perhaps even worse. Uh, for three years, uh, the killing has gone on. The estimates are something like 200,000 dead almost all of those civilians and not fighters, uh, and movement of some nine million Syrian refugees, uh, either in the country or in a number of cases outside to Jordan and Lebanon uh, and Iraq. Um, and the war as it goes on uh, is therefore likely to continue to reap a heavy burden in the neighboring countries of caring for refugees and maybe even involving them more in the conflict as King Abdullah of Jordan did uh, when he responded uh, to the loss of a fighter plane and the brutal killing of the pilot. Um, other, other Arabs are helping in the effort against ISIS. Uh, they undertake some of the uh, missions in which the US does most of the bombing 
uh, but they provide uh, additional protection. And some of them have now, and certainly the Jordanians will continue to be involved uh, in bombing ISIS. Uh, the bombing cannot achieve a result of taking ISIS out of northern Iraq. That must be done on the ground, and it's important that the Iraqi forces uh, do that. Um, in Syria, uh, the uh, problem is clearly how and in what way can that situation be evolved politically uh, to see President Assad gone, to see ISIS diminished and eliminated in its influence, and to use the now distinctly different over 400 militias inside uh, uh, of Syria opposed to the president uh, and some willing to fight against ISIS, but not all. Uh, so it is, in a sense, a witch's brew uh, and tremendously devastating. Um, over time, uh, we've seen a number of ideas come forward. Uh, one of these, uh, interestingly enough, endorsed by the Iranian, the Iranian president, but by a number of others, is that the first step needs to be a ceasefire. There are some local ceasefires in effect now in Syria because of the fatigue among the fighting forces and their inability to affect any change of the situation on the ground. Uh, if they can be pluralized and multiplied, that might work. And the UN Special uh, Representative on Syria, a man by the name of Stefan Di Mistura, of Italian origin but Swedish nationality, it's an interesting combination, uh, is hard over in moving in that direction. Um, I also think with the ceasefire, there needs to be a cease in the flow of outside weapons to the extent that that can be achieved. Um, and then the second step uh, would be an effort to try to put together a transitional government. Maybe a technocratic government could be more easily absorbed in the present Syrian situation uh, because its leaders would not be seen uh, to be partisans of one or a number of the major new factions. That can only work, in my view, when there is a ceasefire first. Uh, the third step, uh, according to some, would be to use an electoral process uh, to give a kind of ratification, uh, a pat on, ba on the back of the new government from the population as a whole. Again, that won't work without ceasefire. And the fourth step, uh, which the Iranians describe in a little more timid fashion than I will, uh, is Mr. Assad's going someplace else. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, the key to making these kinds of things happen uh, is a combination of both the Syrian parties um, and uh, the support of Iran and Russia, which they have not been willing to give up until now, and where I think uh, enormous changes have to take place in circumstances in the region uh, for them to pick up and join us in moving in the direction I've talked about. They have to know and understand uh, that if, in fact, they don't move with us, uh, Mr. Assad and all of their interest in him uh, would be put in danger. Uh, that's why I feel uh, that now uh, judicious support uh, for the opponents to President Assad uh, through the provision of weapons and other things that they need uh, would be valuable and useful in creating a sense uh, in, in Moscow and in Tehran that we do not intend lightly uh, to permit uh, President Assad to resume full control of the, of the country. And they better begin to think about uh, a new leadership uh, if, in fact, they are going to have a long-term interest in that area. Uh, these are very hard things to do, uh, but I think they're important. And I think the three-step approach uh, makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, because it has at least the beginning of a realistic dimension with these negotiated local ceasefires as a starting place. Uh, all of the time, and particularly under conditions of a ceasefire, uh, assistance, particularly food, uh, medical, and health care, ha has to be delivered by the international community uh, to the Syrian opposition. Um, and that's been difficult, but it's been carried on. And I think it will be significant. Uh, one of the military steps uh, that ought to be contemplated, uh, primarily with the use of uh, Arab 
aircraft, but may be backed up by the United States, is to put pressure, further pressure on President Assad uh, by creating uh, all over Syria no-fly zones. Uh, we have, in effect, already, already created one in northern in eastern Syria because we have warned uh, President Assad uh, that as we go there to bomb to support the anti-ISIS people, we expect to see no Syrian military aircraft in the area. And so there is a kind of informal de facto um, situation uh, in northern Syria of a ceasefire already. Um, no one yet has stepped forward with a kind of unified game plan. One has attempted uh, in a serious way. I'm going off and on here. It's getting tired of hearing my voice, and maybe you are too. Uh, but it, no one has yet put together uh, a way in which those uh, particular uh, can be achieved uh, in, in Syria. Uh, but there is at least some thought being given to try to make that happen. And now let me wind up uh, with two subjects, one very short, which I'll take at the end, uh, some of the results of the Arab Spring and some of the needs there. Um, and the most important one, uh, what happens with Israel and the Palestinians? Uh, Secretary Kerry, as I noted, had made a serious effort to try to resolve this. Uh, he failed. Um, it is, in my view now, uh, something that Israel, uh, pending the election, will be much less interested in and we cannot expect anything serious to happen until the Israeli elections are completed uh, on the 17th of March. Um, uh, I would like to see us, uh, for the first time, uh, perhaps after the Israeli elections, uh, put on the table uh, the basic framework or principles uh, that the parties have to accept uh, in order to develop a fair and equitable solution to the problem. They will involve compromises, and compromises involve pain. Uh, heretofore, a number of administrations have promised Israel uh, that we won't put forward any position unless they agree to it. Uh, this means that the Palestinians are going to automatically reject anything we put forward if we continue to do it under that rubric. Uh, but I think there ought to be one more chance for the parties to try to negotiate further uh, a positive outcome for them both in the solution to the region. It will be in President Obama's last year and three quarters or last year and a half, and he has the capacity at this particular time to do that. Uh, failing that uh, and the effectiveness of a U.S. position, uh, I would certainly recommend uh, that we take that position uh, summarize it on paper, and summarize what each country has told us about its dislikes for that position, uh, and modify it where we believe it is necessary uh, to move toward the two parties, uh, but produce a public document containing uh, those two sets of material, uh, something we would call a white paper. Our ideas and why we believe in them, uh, and the objections, if we get them, from Israel and the Palestinians, either orally or in writing. Uh, this is important because if we are going to take a position, the people of the United States need to know what that position is, how it has been put together, uh, what are the objections to that position from each side, and how relevant they are. Uh, after the white paper, I would make another try at negotiations. If they fail, uh, then I would strongly urge that the U.S. take its position uh, to the Security Council in a resolution. Uh, and so what would happen would be uh, the present two resolutions uh, passed years ago to define the end point uh, of Israeli-Palestine negotiations, um, essentially a two-state uh, solution, uh, withdrawal from territory uh, by the Israelis, um, and an effort uh, on the part of the Arabs uh, who have already committed themselves in something originally called the King Abdullah Plan and now the Arab League Plan uh, to provide guarantees for uh, peace for Israel. Uh, these 
uh, approaches that I'm recommending or the approach that I'm recommending would be enormously painful uh, because in making compromises, we'll have to ask Prime Minister Netanyahu to make some serious compromises. And up until now, he's not shown himself uh, ready to take on that kind of flexibility. Uh, a little bit about his visit. Um, his visit obviously uh, has stirred up a small or a large hornet's nest, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, his visit has the major purpose, as he stated, to come and tell the Congress and through them the American people uh, why a new negotiated agreement with Iran is a mistake. Or perhaps more genteely and gently, the things that he would consider to be essential in such an agreement. Uh, and we'll have to wait and see what he says. Uh, but as I said earlier, Israel's position is that Iran should have no enrichment. And I would fully support that. Uh, but it is a millennial position, and in my view, uh, no degree of additional sanctions or threats of war are going to bring the Iranians there. But even more importantly, uh, I believe uh, there is a way to permit some level of continued Iranian enrichment under monitoring and inspection, which would provide a secure enough firewall on Israel's going nuclear uh, that we can live with that. But that will be uh, the big issue, and those will be the bones of contention. And I will stay out of Israeli internal politics, but I'll take you uh, to the broader Middle East, particularly the Arabic-speaking portion of the Middle East, North Africa, the uh, Middle East, and the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, here we've seen a series of changes that began two years ago in Tunisia and then Egypt. Um, there were strong movements and popular movements in the streets uh, to find a way to push forward. Uh, and many of those people, if not all, uh, espouse new democratic governments for these countries under the rule of law and some changes in their own constitutions. Uh, Tunisia uh, has made effective progress there. Uh, Egypt saw first the election uh, of the theocratically inclined Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, uh, only to see them at the end of their first year uh, pushed off their governing seats uh, by the military. And so we now have a military government. In Yemen, uh, we have seen a small but very determined group of Shia who have lived for years in northern uh, Yemen uh, take over in the midst of turmoil uh, and move and capture the capital. Um, and the former president of, uh, of Yemen has moved, in fact, to old South, a South Yemen to the port of Aden. I don't see an easy solution ahead for Yemen, and some are predicting a bifurcation of the state. Uh, however, uh, it is, in my view, a serious mistake, uh, in fact, to separate Yemen, um, and in fact, to uh, allow uh, the, uh, uh, to allow the Shia uh, to control the country when they constitute only a small minority. And there may well have to be some kind of elections. Hopefully they would be UN supervised, but we're nowhere near that now. In other countries, perhaps Bahrain has suffered the most. It has a Shia minority, I'm sorry, a Shia majority run by a Sunni minority. Um, and that's caused a lot of dissension and difficulty. Uh, Bahrain, uh, had the assistance, the military assistance, of the other members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, particularly Saudi Arabia, um, and uh, to some extent Qatar. Um, and they are maintaining the Sunni leadership of the country, uh, but not, in my view, sufficiently attacking uh, the problems that bedevil uh, the Shia minority in that country. Uh, how to go ahead, I've talked about in a number of ways. Uh, I will only say that uh, if we don't move on these issues, uh, particularly uh, the difficult, uh, now buried question of uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace, uh, we will be affected uh, by what I call the first principle uh, of Middle East non-progress. Non, non the status quo doesn't work. Uh, Israel is busy building settlements. Uh, that will make it harder for any future agreement. 
Uh, and the pr process or the principle um, is often called the bicycle principle. If you're not riding forward, you're falling down. Uh, another way of defining the issue. Now, the second major question uh, for most of the Middle East, but particularly for the uh, 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 Israeli-Palestinian question, is the role and place of the United States. Uh, my own sense is that the parties thus far have not shown themselves capable in a room together uh, to bring about the kind of agreement uh, that will hold water, uh, be just, and make sense. Uh, and so the U.S. will have to continue uh, absent the presence of another state uh, that in one way or another can take on this burden. Uh, the U.S. will have to continue, uh, I believe, uh, to nurture that process. A and that's the second principle. The U.S. is probably an essential player, uh, certainly uh, in any negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis but also hopefully in getting negotiations going on Syria and supporting the Iraqi government in recovering its own territory. Uh, the third principle, uh, which I call the happy principle, uh, is best stated this way. Uh, the only thing harder than getting a, a durable, fair, just, and acceptable peace settlement between Israel and the Palestinians uh, is to find a way to stop the process of seeking that settlement finally, forever, never to have it return again. And so, uh, in effect, uh, that's saying, in the end, uh, there is no alternative that is now viable uh, to avoiding uh, a set of diplomatic arrangements which can bring about the end of the conflict. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I probably have spoken longer than my contract allows. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here. And if it's still permitted, Eric, I'll take a few questions.